Okay, let's all welcome our speaker for the day, Jeff Talhammer. I think you have, you have a future in game show host. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if this technology thing doesn't work out. Uh, hey, uh, my name is Jeff Talhammer. I'm a Perl developer. I've got 99 problems. Actually, with Perl, it's probably a bit more than that. But uh, one of those problems is not CPAP. And I'm here to tell you guys why. I'm going to start out by making an assumption. I mean, I'm sorry, an assertion. I'm going to assert that most of your application is not yours. If you think about all the code that has to be deployed to make your application run, how much of it did you write? Probably not much of it. Right? And if you're writing Perl, that means that it came, probably came from CPAM. Right? How many, how many CPAM modules do you guys use? Five? Ten? A hundred? Five hundred? A lot, right? It's a lot of moving pieces. All right? but, but there's a problem if you're building your application from CPAM. The public CPAM is constantly changing. How many CPAM authors in the room? All right, all right, so we get five, six. They can upload stuff to CPAN anytime they want. So the latest release can change at any moment. I can break your code. They can break your code, <laughs> right? They can take stuff down, right? They can say, hey, I'm not going to support this version anymore. I'm going to take it off of CPAN. And now it only exists in the background. And they can do all of this without telling you at all. A perfect example of this actually happened last week. Uh, Perl Critic has been around for a while now, and it has managed to get into lots of lots of companies, lots of organizations. So it's one of those modules that's pretty prevalent. It depends on Config Tiny, which is this little configuration module that Adam Kennedy wrote. Hardly ever changes, except for last week. Someone made a small one-line change to Config Tiny, which caused Perl Critic's tests to break. And suddenly, I got emails from about a thousand people saying, fix ProCritic, please, right? Because now Travis is broken, right? All their automated build processes crap out because this one line change causes this one test to fail. Right? Now, fortunately, that was a fairly innocuous example. It didn't affect the, the, app, the, the actual performance of, of the application or anything. But it's a hassle, right? It means, it means something is broken. The more <coughs> vexing problem here is that you can never build the same app twice. If you're pulling modules out of CPAN to build your application, on Monday you'll get one thing. If you do it on Tuesday, you'll get something else. All dependent on when these guys decide to make releases. All right? Unless you specify the exact versions of the prerequisites. Ah, unless you know all the prerequisites and you can specify all the versions and install everything in the right order. <laughs> hold on, hold on, don't get ahead of me. <laughs> all right, so I'm frankly, frankly, I'm amazed that software works at all. Right? It is so complicated. It just, it boggles my mind that, that it works at all. And the only reason it does is what, is because things, certain things, tend to be fairly consistent. Right. Given a certain set of inputs, the computer will give you an identical set of outputs every time, right? Uh, that's why consistency, consistency matters a lot in software engineering. If you're like me, I want to I be able to turn a crank on my build system, and I want to be able to get the same thing out over and over and over and over again. One way to solve this problem which some people alert, alluded to, was to have a private CPAM. Right? Instead of relying on the public CPAM, which is constantly changing all the time, have your own private CPAM that only changes when you change it. And that's exactly what Pinto does for you. Private CPAM in a box. So, like I said, it only changes when you change it. No more surprises, no more unexpected build failures. Uh, when, when you build an app from one day to the next, you're not left chasing bugs that got introduced because some guy released a new version of whatever on uh, last Thursday. You can always, you can reliably test your code against the same set of dependencies day in, day out. In the end, you end up being able to build the same app every time. Your, your build process becomes what it should be. It's a little factory. 
turn the crank, the same application comes out over and over and over again. Hold on to that. So we've been talking about the public seat pan and, and, and stuff that you get from the wild. Pinto can also hold your own distributions. How many of you, maybe you're not CPAN authors, but you, you package your code into a CPAN style distribution? That pretty good, pretty good. This is still kind of, a lot of shops still don't do this, but the CPAN tool chain is awesome, right? It knows how to test, the tools know how to run your tests, manage your dependencies, all of this stuff, right? And all it takes is like a little five line build file to make all this magic happen. You can package up your own code in the CPAN style distributions and stick them inside a Pinto repository. Right? So you can ship your applications, your, your, your in-house written code, the same way that CPAN authors ship their code. And you can take advantage of all the tool chain stuff that comes with it. So, uh, and, and the main message there is that Pinto not only stores CPAN modules, it stores your own modules too. So now you guys are really excited about Pinto and, and private CPANs. Like these are the most, this is the most awesome idea you've ever seen, right? So what could possibly be better? I, I dare, I dare ask. What could possibly be better than a private CPAN? No one want to guess? Private CPAN is probably ice cream. <laughs> 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 the cherry on top. Beer. Right, how about many private CPANs? If one is good, we can have. More, more must be better, right? <laughs> so with Pinto, it's a bit like Git. You can fork, diff, and revert CPANs. Most of the CPAN tools that are out there right now, you only get one index in your, you only get one index in your mirror. So your CPAN installer only sees one list of modules, usually the latest versions of all the modules in the repository. A Pinto repository, you can have as many mirrors as you want. I'm sorry, as many indexes as you want. So that allows you to do some really cool things that we're gonna, we're gonna see in a minute. So, bottom line, I know you all use CPAN modules. I know all of you have faced at least one bug or, or production fire that you had to put out in the last month because of a CPAN module. So use Pinto, you'll have one less problem, I promise. And that's how you install it. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, time for questions. Okay, uh, I will. I promise to answer that. Uh, one of the nicest things with CPAN is the source, the CPAN dot org, the interface, the web interface. Oh, the web interface. Now, as far as I said, when you mirror the CPAN, you cannot mirror the actual website to search. Uh, that's is correct. Way, is there a way, is there some kind of nice search interface that comes with Pinto? Uh, not with but, Pinto, but someone actually did, just recently wrote a command that you can lay, add on to Pinto that will extract documentation. Uh, so you, it's, it's not as nice as browsing online, uh, but I will show you something even better than that later. I'm making a lot of promises. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can deliver. Any other questions? Yes, that's one use case, right? And we're actually going to go through that right now. Let's say you're starting a new application from scratch. You don't already have some file of legacy. That's what we're going to go through right now. Another use case is you've already got a bunch of Perl, which I'm pretty sure all of you do, otherwise you wouldn't be in this room. Um, you've already downloaded a bunch of modules from, from public CPAN or, or your sysadmin has installed them for you. And you don't really, you probably don't really know what's in your environment, right? It's just, it's just kind of, Whatever's bundle. there. Right? It's, it's you a big, can snapshot the bundle. It's a big mystery, and changing it, is, it requires a bunch of meetings with sysadmins and, and those sorts of people. Uh, a Pinto one of the things you can do with a Pinto repository <coughs> is, is reverse engineer all of that. Figure out what's, what you've got in your environment, 
put that into a Pinto repository and then manage it going forward. Uh, I will not talk about that in a lot of detail today, but that is a, that is a very common use case. Andrew? Well, the other one is, uh, are you looking at one of those, say, so, uh, yes, you will we'll see that. Uh, so, uh, I, I will say uh, a Pinto repository uh, on the surface is exactly like CPAN. Right? It's, and all CPAN is is files on disk. Uh, so, it works completely uh, seamlessly with all the existing installer tools. No surprises there. Now comes the dreaded live demonstration. <laughs> we're gonna first. We're gonna install Pinto, and you can get it from CPAN. Uh, but I recommend using this little installer script that you just hit with curl and then feed it to Bash, and then away it goes. It's gonna install Pinto. A couple of things to note about this installer. One is it's installing it into user Jeff op local Pinto. Pinto is an application. It's not a library. It's not something you put into your Perl 5 lib and then link to and integrate with the rest of your environment, right? You think of it, it's a standalone, opaque application. So all of its dependencies are going to get installed into that location, regardless of what you've got installed on your machine. This is one of the advantages of using this installer, right? I know exactly what versions you're going to get. Why do I know that? Well, because under the hood, this installer is actually getting the dependencies for Pinto out of another Pinto repository in Texas. Right? How's that for eating your own dog food? The I control the dependencies that, that get shipped when this is being installed. And this is just CPANM running right here. Right? No, nothing magical. It's just that CPANM is pulling the dependencies not from the public CPAN, it's pulling them out of this Pinto repository that I have where I control the versions, right? And they only change when I decide to change them. Another thing that I can get away with here is I don't usually run the tests when I install this. I can get away with that because I know exactly what versions are gonna be, right? And I've already smoked them on all the environments that I support. So I can get, I can get a much faster installation that way, fewer headaches, uh, fewer hassles. Is Perl in there So Perl does not get Perl does not ship with Pinto. Uh, all, but that is, that's basically the minimum requirement. As long as you have a Perl, uh, Pinto will bootstrap itself with all the dependencies that it requires from this repository. I don't know why I keep pointing out that it's in Texas. It's just, <laughs> the idea is that it's just, it's not, <laughs> it's not where everything else is. All right, questions on that so far? I think that's really cool. You know, the CPAN toolchain is great for installing libraries but it's really lousy for installing applications, right? I don't want you to know anything about Pinto's internals, right? Unless you're hacking on it, you shouldn't know or care. I don't want them mingled with your libraries. If you, ins if you upgrade your whatever LWP module and it's not compatible with Pinto, this is still gonna work, right? Because it, it, it has its own libraries. All right. So, how do we use Pinto? It's just a command line tool. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a repository. We have to specify where we want the root of the repository to be. I'm just gonna call it my modules. And I use the init command. Now, this, actually, this last bit, this source file, blah, 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 this is a little bit of hand waving I have to do. Normally, you wouldn't have to specify that. For the purpose of this demonstration, I need to sort of do a little time warp from CPAN at one point in time and CPAN at another point in time. So what I have is a couple of snapshots of CPAN at different points in time. One of them is called CPAN today. So I'm going to tell Pinto, tell Pinto that that's my upstream source. That's that's where CPAN is. Any questions on that? CPAN today sounds like it could be a newspaper. <laughs> yeah. Actually, they used to have an RSS feed of all the modules they yeah. added today. Would be a good name for it. Okay. So there, I've created my repository. Let's take a look inside of it. I'm just going to use the, the find command to look inside. And we've got this .pinto directory, which is Pinto's own internals. And then the rest of it should look pretty familiar if you've ever looked inside of a CPAN. Right? There's an author's directory. 
Uh, there's a modules directory. Here's your index, O2 package details. So it's exactly like what you find on a CPAN mirror. And that's why it's compatible, exactly compatible with all of these, all the CPAN tool chain. Uh, you can just point CPAN or CPANM at that directory and away you go. But there's no, there's no content in this, in this thing, right? It's not a mirror. We, we have to decide what to put in it. The initial repository is empty. All right, so that dash root argument is pretty much required for every Pinto command. You have to tell it where the repository is. I'm lazy, I don't want to have to type that, so I'm just going to set this quick environment variable so we don't have to see it anymore. All right, so we're, on a, we're working on a project, and it's a web application. So what's the first, app, first thing we need when we're going to make a web application? 500 modules of Catalyst. Okay. Yeah. We, we've already we've already boy, we've already boycotted Catalyst. <laughs> so instead, uh, instead we're going to install Dancer. Yeah. All right. And so to do that, I mean normally what you do at this point, right, is you would go out and cpanm Dancer, install it on your machine, do some hacking, and then let's say you know see. Dancer is not part of your, your default stack, right? You, you've got to now go to your system data and have him install it, maybe in a production environment, or you have to somehow put that on your list of dependencies so that it gets into the, into the build somehow. But there's a small problem with that, right? You download one version of Dancer, put it in your development environment, start hacking away. You know, by the time you go to release, it's a week, two weeks, a month later, right? And it's a different version of Dancer. That's, that's, that's up on the CPAN, right? Or maybe it's the same version of Dancer, but it has different, you know, the dependencies have now changed underneath. It, you know, anything could have happened. So by the time you go to your system and have them install Dancer in your production environment, or you decide to, uh, uh, you know, get an RPM made of Dancer or whatever it is that you do, the world has changed, right? So what we're going to do instead with Pinto is we're going to ask Pinto to install it and we're going to add this little do pull argument and what that's going to do is it's, Pinto is going to go out and fetch the latest version of Dancer right now, pull it into its own repository and unwind all of its dependencies to do the same. So there it did it. We get a little message where we can describe what has happened. Ooh, we, Change the lights at all. Oh, it's such better, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Pinto's a bit like a version control system. So after every uh, critical change, you get prompted with a little message like this, uh, where you can describe what's going on. And what, what we're seeing here is these are all the packages that have now been brought into your Pinto repository. You got Dancer, HTTP body. These are all the dependencies that Dancer had. Pinto has gone through and, and unwound everything. So your question was about, you know, how do I, how do I deal with all those dependencies? Uh, well, normally we only talk, we we typically only think about the top level dependencies. You know, the things our application uses. Pinto handles all the recursive stuff all the way down, so you don't have to think about it too much. But it, but it saves all of those things for you, right? So that they don't change out from underneath you. And. Over here on the right, you can see we've got, these, these are the actual distributions that contain the packages that were over here on the left. Okay, so I'm gonna leave a little, leave a little log message here. New, get, new, uh, what do we, Okay. There. Oh, and now, now it's going to work. Now CPANM is installing Dancer, but notice where the dependencies are coming from. Right? They're coming out of this My Modules directory. Uh, you can dim it up, down, whatever, whatever you guys find the most readable. I don't care. Uh, so it's not, it's not installing them from the public CPAN. It's installing them from this little local repository, you can think of it like a cache or a proxy. 
And now, every time that I want to install something, if I, if I go to my buddy next, in, the, in the cube next door and say, hey, get Dancer, and, and start hacking on this, on this branch for me, with me, he can point his installer at that Pinto repository and versions of you have. Okay. No mysterious, like, hey, it works on my machine. No, mm -hmm. I hate those conversations. <laughs> Can you, want, can you have multiple um, Pinto repositories talking to each other, like <coughs> now Git without a centralized server? So or is Pinto the centralized server? No, Pinto is more old school. It's it's a centralized service. Service. It's not. I'm not smart enough to make a decentralized one. Uh, the reason for that is, well, like I said, I'm not smart enough. Also, because the the things that you're working with here are are binary. They're the tarballs, right? You can't really merge them. Uh, so, so doing doing like a pull uh, or a push, uh, it, I don't know. It doesn't really make sense uh, to to a Pinto repository. But uh, there is a Pinto server, so you can host your Pinto repository on one machine and access it from a lot of uh, from various remote machines. So it's it's designed for team use. Uh, all right, so now we've gone ahead and we installed Dancer and all of its dependencies. Yay! Okay. We started working on our, oh. Let's, let's, let's take a look inside our Pinto repository. For that, we use the list command, and it spits out eh, something that looks a lot like that log message we were just looking at. We can see we've got all these modules in here. Uh, I don't know how many of it hold control. But at any time, you can, you can use the list command to poke around and see what's inside your Pinto repository. All right. Let's say we've, we've started on our application. A couple weeks into it, we discover, crap, there's a bug in the URI module. Right, so URI is one of those basic modules that everybody uses for handling URIs. HTTP, FTP, whatever, like parsing all the, parsing all that stuff. Everybody uses the URI. Let's say we find a bug in it. We get, we contact the author, and most Perl authors are, are really nice guys. But let's just pretend this guy is a real jerk, <laughs> and he won't take your patch. He, he says he says no way. This this is not going to fly. Um, you know, it's, it's gonna, this is gonna require a much bigger fix that will take weeks to get done. And you guys have to, you have to ship this Frogulator app, like, tomorrow. So what are you gonna do, right? Let's say you patch URI, right? You, 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 you bundle it up into a tar -GZ and you make your own variant of it. Now normally this, this, this is kind of a pain, right? Because where, where are you gonna put this? How do you get this into your, into your install process, right? It didn't come from CPAN. If you're not accustomed to building your own uh, your own distributions, this is kind of one of those weird out-of-band situations where now you've got to go to a sysadmin and have him install, install this thing, but then, oh, we might have to replace it with something else a little bit later. It's very awkward when you have to get in the situation of patching the CPAN model. With Pinto, it's, it's quite a bit easier, right? You, you've got the patch, you just stick it into your repository with an add command. Uh, oh, there we go. Again, we get prompted for a message. Uh, we hope our patch gets accepted. Of Can you turn those messages on that? Yes. Yes, you can just say, you know, accept the default message, don't bother to type it. Now, so now we put our, our version of, of URI into, into our repository. But there's a, there's a problem here. What if some other module requires an upgrade of URI? Right? And if we're not paying attention, URI might get upgraded to the next version. And we don't, but we don't know if they've accepted our patch yet. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen, or at least it doesn't happen without us knowing about it. So uh, this, somebody had a question about what happens when 
you want to change one thing but not another. <coughs> so that's that's what uh, pin, Pinto has a, a pin command, which is basically a way of saying don't ever let this module change uh, unless I tell you to. So if some other dependency, if you're upgrading something over here and it requires a new version of URI or whatever it is, the pin will prevent that. So now that we've added this patch version, it's a good idea to go ahead and pin it just to make sure that it doesn't accidentally change from out from under you when you upgrade Dancer or some other module like that. Uh, so it doesn't change until we know our patch. So now I'm going to fast forward in time. We've released version one of of the Frobulator app. It's been a huge success. Uh, I'm going to fast forward in time by changing this little config file. Uh, I'm, going to I'm going to fast forward by changing the config file to point to a new CPAN snapshot that was taken at a, at a later point in time. So imagine uh, it's a couple months later, the Frobulator app is a huge success. It's got so much traffic that the boss is like, you know, the servers are melting. What are we, what are we going to do here? So you go on CPAN, you start looking for a solution, and you see a new version of Dancer has come out. And wow, it's, it says it's 10, it's 10 times faster. It has this new whiz-bang caching feature, and so it's, it's just awesome now. So you want to try that out. Uh, so what, what are we going to do? We're going to have Pinto fetch it again for us. Except this time, instead of just asking for any old dancer, I have to make sure I ask for the latest version, or a, a particular version. Otherwise, if I just said, get dancer, it would say, well, you already have it. So here you go. Right? Remember, the whole point of Pinto is to, just, is to keep your dependencies constant, unless you decide to change them. So when you want to upgrade, you have to be a little more explicit about it. So the latest version is 13116. Well, let's go ahead and have Pinto fetch that for us. So it's going to go off, go to the CPAN, the public mirror, try and grab Dancer, and then, oh, bam! Unable to register distribution URI 160 because it is URI is pinned to 158 patched. What does this mean? Anyone want to venture a guess? Hopefully it's Right, right. So at that point, if your install script bomb version, you can install everything else it could? No, no. So it's transactional. It stopped and said, nope, this isn't going to work. All, so, all so you have a install. No, I haven't. I nothing has been installed. Uh, the repository has not changed. Right? Each one of these commits is each one of these trans, uh, commands is, is transactional. It's all or nothing. So if any if for some reason Pinto can't satisfy your dependencies, maybe it can't find a dependency on CPAN, it stops, rolls back the transaction, and the repository goes to the previous state. So that way, that's one of the frustrating things about doing a CPAN install, right? Is it goes halfway, blows up. And then you're kind of like, what's going on? So Pinto doesn't necessarily solve that problem on the installation side. But in terms of the, the distributions that it has, they'll always be written there in the transactional way. So you're, 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 you'll always, you could be pretty confident about the state of your repository. Uh, but the bottom line, yeah, it was, the new version of Dancer requires URI 1.6.0. But we have pinned it to URI 158 patched. That's the patched version that we wrote. Uh, because we don't want that to change until we know that whatever bug it is that we found has been fixed by the upstream author. Go ahead, Drew. Can you keep a spare um, into a repository of your patches and then you check against this URI or if you start getting into the URI to patch it? Uh, I think I'm about to answer your question. So, 
I don't know about you guys, but I, I often forget what has happened in the past. So I could have discovered all of that, again, by using the log command to see those messages that I had left. It would help explain why URI was pinned in the first place. So Pinto is like a version control system. This looks a lot like Git, but it's not Git. Um, but the point I want to make is that the nice, a nice thing about Pinto is you have this trail of breadcrumbs that can help explain why your dependencies are the way that they are. We do, we do a great job of that with source code, right? We all leave wonderful, descriptive, helpful commit messages, right? Sure we do, sure we do. Right, but, but we don't ever really do, we don't give that much thought to our dependencies, right? We say like, ah, upgraded foo. That's about all we say, right? He, 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 uh, Matt here, he doesn't want to leave a message at all, right? He just wants, he just wants a, a switch that he can throw uh, and it'll just say, you know, upgraded whiz bang, which Pinto will do for you. But I like having a message that means something. So Pinto gives you that, that ability. All right, so now we know why URI was patched in the first place. So the way that we go about dealing with this, and I think this is what Andrew was getting at. I said earlier that Pinto can have many repositories, many indexes. And they're called stacks in, in the Pinto language. Each one of these indexes is called a stack. We can copy one stack to another, make the change to the index over there, build our application, run the tests, see if it all works out. Uh, and then we can do all this in isolation. So that, let's say we have a, we, say we have a production stack, right? These are the blessed versions of, of what's, uh, what's in production right now. I want to make my changes in isolation from that. So the, the DevOps guys can go ahead and they can rebuild the application, deploy on new machines, whatever. I won't disrupt what they're doing. I'm going to do all my development in a separate little sandbox. To do that, we can copy a stack with the copy command. The default, when you create a new repository, the default stack is called master. And I'm just going <coughs> to call a new one too. And in a second, now I'll have Essentially, now I essentially have two CPANs inside my Pinto repository. One called master and one called foo. I can see that by using the stacks command. This is sort of like your branches command in Git. It'll show me what are the different stacks in this repository. There's foo, there's master. Uh, master has a star because it's the default stack, and I can explain what that means later. Right out here, you know, we have the last modified time, the user, the, a little bit of the commit ID and a little bit of the commit message. And you can see that they're identical, right? Which is what you expect. When you start a new branch, both heads point to the same revision. When you start a new branch, does that make a copy of the binaries and only the binaries have to change the index? No, the binaries, there's all, what, cop, what gets copied is the index, not, not, the, uh, not the modules themselves, or the, the, the tar GGs. And that's another restriction that Pinto has, right? Once you put a tarball into it, it stays there forever. It never changes, right? If you want to make a new release of something, you have to give it a different name or number. So this is the same rules that pause has. You can only upload foobar 1.6 tar gz. You can only upload that once, right? Because it has to, there's a, they, all, they all have to live on the file system together, so you can't share uh, there's a limited namespace. Uh, same rules apply to Pinto. Is the copy made on the Pinto server? So do you have a local Pinto copy to the local Pinto? There's, Pinto is a centralized sort of system. So there's, no, there's really no such thing as a local and a remote. Um, there is a server, uh, when I spoke earlier about the, the Pinto server, you can host the Pinto repository on a remote machine with a server sitting on top of that. And what you can do is you can give it commands from a remote machine. You don't actually clone it onto your local hardware the way you would with the Git repository. You're just basically just sending commands over the wire uh, rather than having a local copy. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unpin URI but I'm only going to do it on the foo stack, not on the master. 
not on the main line. Why can you use the unversioned name in that command, but you can't when you um, uh, load or update or anything? Um, so, let me, let me, let me type my commit message and I'll ask you. Try upgrading this. Okay, so my question was, back when I was uh, installing, I wanted to... Oh, you did put it with that. No, no. Right, right. So here, here I have here I had to specify a version. Right, I had to say dancer or something something. But when I did that pin and unpin command, I didn't have to specify a version. That, that's that's your question, right? Yeah, yeah. You needed the version when you added it, but not when you pinned it. That's that's it's what I was pinning the latest version. version you got, so. so on a on a some commands. Uh, so 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 this command. Uh, you know, what it's doing is it's having to go out and look at the outside world, the outside CPAM, uh, and decide whether or not it needs to a newer version uh, or not. So if, if I had just said Dancer without a version, it would have given me back whatever version it currently has. By, by specifying a particular version or a later version than what's in the repository, that causes Pinto to then go out into the wild and try and find a version that satisfies that, that minimum. Uh, something we're working on here is a little different notation. So you could say like Dancer at 1.2, let's say. And it would get you precisely Dancer version 1.2. This, this is still a little sucky here because you know I've said 1.3116, but what that really boils down to is give me the latest version on CPAM that is at least 1.3116. All right, that's how your CPAN installers typically work. Even even CPAN M is like that. Well, maybe maybe he's changed that now. But all right, you you get you always get something that's at least this good, but usually uh, it, it, it's, it's 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 the latest version that is at least as good as, as what you're asking. Sorry. So, uh, just a quick question that was not good. There. So, Pinto says get Dancer, it complains, this version of Dancer needs a newer version of something. Correct. What if I've already got a newer version of Dancer in store? Does it tell me you've got a version that isn't what you thought you had? So, if you, so right here it's saying uh, we need 160 to satisfy Dancer, but we only have 158. Right. So let's say 1.7 is installed. What do you mean by install? Somewhere, wherever. In, in your pins, if you, instead of having pinned at 158, you pinned at 170. Or it got changed back at some point. So, the, 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 way, the, the way the Pinto resolves the dependencies is whenever it needs to find a prerequisite, say, foo 1.0. First, it looks on the stack that you're working at. So, so this is on the master stacks. First it says, well, do I have Foo 1.0 on the master stack? If, if yes, then all is good. Stop there. Nothing else to do. If it's not on the master stack, then it looks at the rest of the repository, right. which means all the other stacks and all the other things that you might have fetched at any point in time. Right? And it sees if it can find a satisfactory prerequisite there. And then if it still can't find anything there, then it goes out to the wild and to an upstream repository and says, give me the latest thing you have. And it will see, it'll look to see if that is satisfactory for your... Yeah, but does it tell you that? It does it tell you where it's getting it from? Oh, or if the dependency is newer. This is telling you that it wants a newer one. Right. If you have one that is even yet newer than that, it's going to say, that's great. Right. Right. If, 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 you, if your index already contains satisfactory dependencies right. for whatever that module requires, then there's 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 nothing there's no news. So I can't say I need this version. I can say I need at least this version. So what I think you're probably getting at is 
you want to construct a Pinto repository that has a bunch of very cherry-picked versions yeah. of prerequisites. Yeah. And that is, that is the, the use case I was referring to earlier. You've got this legacy application. You want, to see, you want to build up a Pinto repository that will produce exactly what you have in production right now. Right? So you don't want to be, you want to be particular about the dependency. You don't want to just take, take the latest. Uh, I'll talk about that later. Okay. You oh, have a on the version number, you said you know, get answer and like one point three or whatever. Yeah. Is there a way to say just get the current, get the latest one? I wish. Oh. Uh, that, that's a missing feature. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you have a hundred modules you have to go through? Well, here's the thing, guys. I, I mean, maybe I'm going against the grain a little bit, but but I I, I think. I think you should be mindful about your dependencies, right? And not just sort of like throw everything, oh, upgrade everything at once, right? Because that, that's going to be a big hairball to debug if, if something goes wrong, right? So managing dependencies is something you should do often and in small steps. What we tend to do is we tend to do it infrequently and we do it in big steps, which, is, which sucks, right? Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to sort of give you guys a shotgun that will say, upgrade everything, right? Uh, because that's exactly what I don't want you to do. If, if that's what you want to do, you might as well just use a public CPAP. Right? You don't need Pinto. But he was never going to upgrade everything. He was talking about upgrade this to the newest, so I don't have to go look and see what the newest is and then go back and tell it. Yes, you that, that, it. that is worthwhile. You can feed it to Tarball, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, or you could get fetch the tar about yourself, but I agree. Like I don't I don't want to keep track of version numbers in my head necessarily. I want to just say, okay, I know there's a new URI, give me give me the latest, whatever that is. I have some more I have some more sugar for that later. Um alright so what have we done? We upgraded oh no no we we unpinned URI on the foo stack. Now we're gonna do the install again. But this time, I'm going to specify which stack to work from, the foo stack. With the other commands, we didn't have to specify that because it, Pinto automatically will go to the default stack if you don't specify one. Uh, the star means that it's the default. And then we're going to say, give me dancer 13116. Right now, I'm probably going to. I'm not charging, which makes me very nervous. Um, okay, I'll take care of it. Okay. Yeah, some, some like don't. Uh, Does the little green light come on or something? Mm -hmm. Man, to turn on the screen. I hope I didn't mess it up. The screen got brighter. Oh, that's probably a good sign. That's a good okay. sign. <laughs> This battery is so old, it'll really only pull the charge for like. Yeah, I know my battery's just gonna die right in the middle. Um, you get the laptop or the adapter? Oh, wait, this is. This is. Oh, uh oh. Uh -oh. There, you go. No, it's there is a. There's a plug in the wall. Dean, do you want to give it your plug? One of these has got to work. I mean, yeah, the one I plugged into is working. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah. yeah, unplug Ian. <laughs> 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 if you have to. It's the only one, but, you know, with all those other plugs, okay. I, I appreciate that you tried another one. All right. Is it working? So, um, so now we got power. I think we'll, I think we'll make it through. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Dancer 3116. Oh, this actually came from a different author this time. All right, now CPANM goes to work and installs the latest dancer from, again, pulling it from our repository, not from the public CPANM. And it's going to install any new new dependencies that the new version of dancer requires. This will take uh, about another 30 seconds to finish. Questions? Can you point your native CPANM to the 
that if somebody does the same kind of operation, Right. So, the yes, the answer is yes. How, how you want to sort of say, all right, uh, as a, as a team or as a company, this is going to be our Pinto repository. This is where we're going to stash all of our our official blessed modules, right? And anytime somebody wants to install something, we want to make sure it comes out of that repository, or at least it comes through that repository, so that we can capture it and make sure that we always have it going forward. Yes, all you have to do is configure everybody's CPAN client to point the Pinto. Now, how do you do that? Well, it depends on how you guys manage your environment. Right? If everybody uses the same version of Perl with the same CPAN, then you could set up uh, the, whatever the CPAN config module. You could hard code that at the system level to point to CPAN, uh, point to your Pinto repository. Um, but if you got people using Perl Brew, they're, they're cooking their own Perl, they, have their, they manage their own tools and things like that, then it's a bit more complicated. Uh, that's mostly a social engineering problem, getting everyone to row the boat in the same direction. Uh, but, but technically, yeah, it's completely feasible. Um, Alright, so one of the things you can do with your Git repository is you can look at a diff between two branches, right? Well, Pinto does the same thing. We can do a diff between master and foo. Remember, those are the two stacks. One of them, we upgraded URI. Uh, I'm sorry, upgraded Dancer, right? So the green stuff here, the things that were added. This is Dancer 316 has been added. Like you going on down, you can see that Dancer 1150 was removed. Keep going down, I can see all the dependencies that got upgraded as well. Uh, file listing, HTML, yada yada. Uh, here's a good example. You know, so HTTP body used to be at 1.06. The new version of Dancer requires it something newer, and we ended up with 1.17. All right. In case you didn't pin that, it went ahead and opened. Yeah. Right. If I had pinned those any of those things that it depended on, if I had pinned them at their present version, uh, Pinto would have puked and said, no, I, I can't do this. You, you, you said that I can't upgrade this module, I'm not going to allow you to have this other module uh, because of that. So you have multiple Pinto sort of snapshots, but that doesn't give you multiple installs, right? It's still just installing where a CPM would install, where the installer would install, right? So there's a little bit... Uh, there's install in the sense of actually doing the build and putting the PM files on your local machine. Right. Uh, that is how you decide to do that is up to you. Right. They're all the, the last two things that I installed. Yeah, they all ended up in the same whatever my Pro Five lib is configured to be at that time. Uh, so Pinto has this install command. What it is is it's a combination of really two commands. There's a pull command, which just fetches things into the Pinto repository. And then the install adds the cpanm feature on top of it. And so it pulls it into the repository and then runs cpanm to install it from the repository. Um, it's, the install is really nice for this demo because it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's tidy. But I think in, in most practical situations, you probably will pull, use the pull command to get something into your repository first. Then you'll kind of look at it and think about it for a little while, and then maybe you'll install it. Is there a more really foul between this, this command? No, not right now. What people have, I, I think what people want, because you're not the first. The distribution. Right? They, they, right, they just want to see distributions, right, rather than each and every package. Um, I'm a little bit obsessed with packages, because this is this is the really thorny thing about CPAN, right? This, this, the CPAN doesn't have a good sense, there's no good model of a distribution. It's really good at modeling these packages, right? but the thing that it comes in, it doesn't really keep track of. It can be named whatever the hell you want. And that, that's problematic. What, what, what really matters to pause and the CPAN installers are these little packages inside. Um, I won't go into a lot of details about that, but in a small number of cases, 
the packages are really important, more so than the disks. I understand. It's an option. Well, as, as an option, I completely agree with you. It's text out though. You could just pipe it to cut, sort, remove, and it'll give you exactly. And we'll <laughs> There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, this is a huge book queue. <laughs> uh, I I, I want to win the award for the most outstanding bugs against my CPAN model. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Pinta or CPAN uh, Pearl Critic takes the cake for the single buggiest uh, distribution. Yeah, that probably means you have the most users. Uh, that's how I. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I tell myself. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, because they're all great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with a name like that, just set yourself up. All right. So, uh, so we've we've upgraded Dancer. We deployed it. We built it. Uh, all the tests passed. We deployed it into our into our QA or beta environment or whatever it is, and it's awesome. It's ten times faster, just just like Yannick promised. And, and the boss is thrilled. So now it's time to go ahead and do this in production. Now normally, uh, what I would really like to be able to do is to just say merge. Right? I want to merge the dependencies from the Foo stack over to the master stack. Um, we're working on that. There was a, there's a grant that has been issued to, to complete that work. But it's not done yet. So what I'm going to do right now is effectively like a manual merge. Like the same thing you would do if you're going to manually merge your source code, you go, you know, you switch from one branch to another, you make the same change, you commit. It's it's very ugly, but uh, that's what we're going to do here. We're going to go ahead and unpin URI on the master stack. Dancer. Now notice it was really, really fast that time. Right. It was fast because it didn't have to go out into the wild to satisfy that dependency. It already had what it needed right then and there. Question. Do you want to be able to drop the food stack now? Or? You could. You could. So now if I do, if I diff them again, what should the output be? Hopefully nothing. Nothing. Right? Wonderful. So now we know, now, that, that, that in itself I think is pretty cool. Yeah. I know that the dependencies yes. over here are the same as the dependencies over there. It's usually the different even typos. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I follow, but. Oh, sorry. Anything, you anything that you type wrong will be in the diff. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that, that's kind of like a, a big question that I always had whenever someone would come to me with a bug that I, that I couldn't figure out. It's like, well, what version of the modules do you have? Right? And Some it's modules, like, it's kind of hard to find. You know, it's like, oh, I, don't, I don't really know. Uh, well, if, if they could tell me, well, I built, you know, we're running off of this, uh, off the through stack, right? If, take, if, if the DevOps team could tell me that, well, then I can go back and be like, oh, okay, well, let me recreate that environment. I can build up exactly those modules uh, and test my application with exactly the same stuff that you've got. And I have a much better chance of being able to, to find and, and treat the bug there. So if it's just like a random crapshoot, I don't know, I'm going to spend hours trying to debug something that may not even really be my bug, right? It could have been introduced by some upgrade that somebody else did. Could you have just copied um, yes. So, in this case, we're we're making one into the other. Uh, it's basically it's a fast forward merge essentially. Uh, what we could have done is just rename. Uh, is there a rename command? I think there is. Yeah, you could just rename foo as master uh, to get the same result. Trash master. Pardon? Trash the existing master. No, it, it'll you probably have to kill the master first. Here, let's try that. We could say oh. Not, that's, the, that's the end of our show. Uh, but I can say our test kill master. Uh, oh, that's not what it's called. It's 
called my logins, right? Yeah. yeah. Kill the something. master. Oh, cannot kill the default stack. Yeah. So there's a rule that you, you can't kill the default. So default to foo. Now kill master. <laughs> Rename uh, to uh, stacks. Oops, stacks. There. Now I've got one stack called master, uh, and it points to that last commit we did. Um. Questions? There's a lot of Pinto commands. This is good that this popped up. Um, it's not a full-blown uh, version control system. It doesn't do all of the cool things that Git does, but it does just enough of them to help you keep track of your modules a lot better than you're probably doing right now. That's good. That sort of begs the question, can you integrate it with a uh, version control system? You, you can. can. So, early versions of Pinto actually were built on Git or SVN. You could use either one. And basically, every time that you change something in your repository, it was just a commit. Uh, a commit to Git. Uh, after a while, uh, we, I kind of abandoned that because it wasn't that helpful. The, the, using Git wasn't really that much more useful than it's just a backup really is all it is. And you can still do that if, if, you, if you want. You could have a, uh, you could set up a hook to commit this to a Git repository after, you know, anytime something happens. But you're not able to merge that, um, you know, if you, you can't work on it in a distributed fashion because the Pinto database is binary, the tarballs are binary, there's not much that you can do with I mean, Git is great for managing the source code. It's not really meant for managing binaries. Pinto, on the other hand, because it knows a little bit more about what a CPAM distribution is, uh, it's in a position to actually do like a meaningful merge. It can actually figure out, like, okay, these packages were added over here, uh, and they were removed over there, and it kind of knows that usually you tend to want to go towards newer version, you favor newer versions over later versions. So it can actually do things that are a little bit smarter than what Git would do with your repository. So yes, you can use Git or SVN, but it ends up just basically being a, a, a snapshot mechanism rather than a version control system. But I assume you're saving all the tarballs, right? You're not just saving the latest tarballs. So if you install um, you know, module one, and you install module 1.1, .1, and you install module 1.2, you don't delete 1.0, right? That's correct. So you've still got all of the tarballs that you used ever to install anything from you, That's even without it being a version control. That is correct. So you can do the rollback. Correct. <coughs> uh, one of the other things we're cooking is, is a revert or reset kind of command. So if you make a release one day, and then you find out, oh crap, it doesn't work. You need to go back to a known good state. Now maybe maybe you have uh, you know, maybe your DevOps team can, can do that with the click of a switch. Maybe not. What you could do with Pinto is you could just move the pointer back to the last revision that you knew worked and rebuild from that. So you say Pinto uh, has hooks, so I mean request. Uh, if you have a CPAM to RPM script, I want to generate RPM upon every new. Ah, ah. So, okay. speaking of RPMs, uh, so, so it's, it does not have hooks in the sense that, that you're thinking. Mm -hmm. But it's good that you mentioned RPMs anyway. How many of you do use RPMs? Okay, okay so I'm not a sysadmin, so you can stone me saying this right but my impression is that making RPMs for each and every little Perl module that you have is, is just a pain in the ass right you have to either go find them in the wild in which case they're almost always a couple versions out of date or you have to make them yourself 
And yes, you can automate a lot of it, but you know, whatever work that is multiplied by uh, every version that you have to produce for every platform, uh, it, just, it just seems like a whole lot of work to me. Perl already has a pretty decent tool chain for managing its own dependencies. Granted, it's, it's lousy for anything else. Right? You can't use CPAN to manage you know, building Apache or, or, or anything like that. But it's pretty good at managing Perl models. So what I suggest, uh, I've seen this, this actually does work, is you use something like Pinto and the CPAN toolchain to build all of your Perl stuff into one wad. And then you package that one wad as an RPM. And you bind it with whatever other dependencies it needs. But so instead of having like 50 Perl RPMs, you have one. So that's that's what that's all I have to say about RPMs. Well, I do have, uh, I'm a DevOps engineer. Okay. So we have a DevOps environment. A lot of stuff is uh, a shell script. Well, uh, some are pearls. There is a Java package that we uh, need to be made. So everything has to go for RPMs. And I found that, that first of all, at least for uh, the CentOS Red Hat coil, most of it is properly packaged, and it, it's it's safe because it's like it preserves versions. And on the other hand, there is that uh, CPAN to RPMs uh, script, which uh, is very smooth to make RPMs out of either your own models that you prepare uh, that you prepare in CPAN fashion. All the models that for some reason haven't been packaged, for example, they are, they come from, not from CPAN or from some other, from, from some other because they all, for some reason they have been missed by uh, the CentOS uh, okay. there. So it's not a big hassle to, uh, to, to package all, 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 uh, all separate models, all separate distributions. Okay. Well, the trick is you got 500 CPAN models, you want to do 500 so usually. By so all means, use RPM, yeah. right? But so the question is, do you want to have one RPM for every, each and every Perl module? Yeah, well, or if you use a tool like CPAN spec, then it, it builds it for you. So, more than one width. Yeah. Sure. But, sure. This, <laughs> but this still would work well with that, because you don't have to, I mean, you can have one area where you've got your own sandbox run by Pinto. And then, you know, where you're working with the sysadmins in their environment, then, you know, the ones that they need can go as RPMs. You can do it both ways. Uh, yes, yes. The, the important thing about Pinto is that you want to keep track of your dependencies, right? You want to control them rather than being at the mercy of whatever's going on in the public CPAC. So that, that's lesson one. Uh, lesson two, like I said earlier, it's, it's very helpful to package your own code in the form of a CPAC distribution. It's a bit of a mind shift, you know, if, if it's, and it's not always appropriate. Some, some applications, web applications in particular, you know, the, the deployment mechanism is basically like git checkout or an rsync or something like that. Sometimes that makes a lot of sense. Um, but if you have a sufficiently complicated application, you know, you're part of an organization that where there's a lot of sharing of code across teams and across mm -hmm. organizational boundaries, carving up that code into little distributions that you can share the same way that all of us CPAN authors share code with you uh, can be extremely helpful. And, and, and Pinto makes that easy because you have your own CPAN, essentially. Question? Can you configure Pinto to not store any of this stuff and simply use it as a dependency manager? Let's say you've got a company that's got their own CPAN repository that you're their manager. Mm -hmm. And rather than having everybody pull a copy into their environment as part of Pinto, so if you say, Always get a PC panel Um No. Okay. In that case, uh, I would I would say that I, I would say that that, that central C pan repository ought to be a Pinto repository. Right. It's yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> I should probably put that. But it's an interesting part. But, but and and so let's say you're in a large organization. Um, Teams move uh, at different speeds 
mm-hmm. products have different release schedules. Mm-hmm. The company might, as a whole, might bless versions one, five, and six of a certain module. Mm-hmm. Um, but not everybody's going to want to use one, five, and six or upgrade to from one to five to six at the same time. So uh, the virtue of having your own stash of that, uh, one is the storage. Storage is not really a big deal, right? Um, you're you're not going to yes, the CPAN itself is large, but you use a tiny fraction of it, right? maybe a hundred megabytes. Um, so, so storage is so. So, everybody having their own copy of the tarballs is not a big deal. Um, I think I would argue that you want to have control of that. You, you want to have your own stash. You want to have your own index, separate from any kind of central uh, authority, because you're going to upgrade on your timetable, not on everyone else's. I don't, did, that, did that go to your question? Yes, I, I could argue against that point, but <laughs> I could argue against the point that the size doesn't matter. We have fifteen hundred engineers engaged with another hundred megabytes IP is going to scream. We, mm-hmm. uh, if you have a full copy of CPAN, you already have all the versions, yeah. and yeah. having to copy them around again is purely wasteful. Simulate to the central copy and be done. But it's not how it works today, so okay. Well, there is, you can have a, a central Pinto repository, right? It doesn't, it's not something that every, every engineer needs to copy. Right. Every team or product group probably ought to have one. Every team ought to have a stack in one shared repository. Or you could roll that way. Yeah. So a stack is just a slice, a particular slice of the repository. So that's, I like that, Mike. You could have, uh, that's what we're doing. Access control becomes issue. So, right, it's, uh, it's, you know, a, a stack is like a branch. It's not really an access control mechanism. Um, you can separate repositories and restrict access that way. Yeah. Uh, but with a stack, not so much. Um, so, there is something you can do. Uh, it's kind of experimental. You can chain Pinto repositories together. Um, when I configured that one, I, I pointed it at one upstream repository. You could chain them together, and it will, when it needs to go fetch an upstream dependency, it will look through them successively until it finds one. And so, in that sense, you could theoretically construct like a network of these repositories, where maybe you have one central organization. Uh, you have just different teams; so they're all pumping out different releases of their code being consumed by different, uh, by other different parts of the organization. Um, each, everybody's having their own local stash of, of, that, uh, of that data and, and their own index to work from. Sort of, it's kind of like the way forking gets done on GitHub, where it's this very networky kind of thing. I don't know how, work, how well it works in practice, but in theory it's there. The other thing I want to show you guys is some eye candy. Um, Pinto, as awesome as it is, right, it's, it's another tool that you have to manage in your toolchain. It's another thing you have to learn how to use. It's not hard, it's got great documentation, but it's still, you know, it, it's, it's another moving, moving part in your environment. So, Stratapan is a hosted service built on top of Pinto. It is Stratapan is to Pinto what github.com is to Git. So this is in beta right now. Uh, I'll give you a sh- quick little show. I'll log in. Um, here I've got my, my list of repositories that I've, that I've constructed. Um, and each of these is, will have separate copies of those binaries. Uh, but again, the, in practice they, they end up being pretty small. Um, I could share this with my entire team, so I wouldn't need it, you know, even if I have 1,500 engineers on my team, which that's a lot of engineers. <laughs> um, right, there, not everybody needs that. that I can have one uh, repository and share it with a whole bunch of people. And we'll look at the Apple one here, for example. 
Now, Apple, at any given time, Apple supports uh, two or three operating systems for most of their applications. Uh, at the time that I was working there, uh, it was it was Lion and Snow Leopard, I think. And so, those shipped with slightly different versions of Perl on them, and they had slightly different sets of modules. So when I wanted to work on an application for them, a Perl application, I needed a way to emulate that environment without having to switch operating systems. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to have to dual boot or something on my laptop. I just wanted to be able to create an environment that was, that was like Snow Leopard or like Lion. And so that's, that's what I have set up here. I have two different, actually I have three stacks within this repository, and each of them has this assortment of modules. Uh, I can kind of filter through this real quick. Specifically in this example, well, the reason why that is because the pearls are different themselves. Correct. So you see, you see you're still vulnerable yeah. because of the difference in... I can switch pearls pretty easily with Pearl Brew. Right. What I that that's that's not so hard. What's hard is having having the right set of modules to go with it. Yeah, but uh, you also maintain uh, the stacks of the core modules that ship Perl itself. So so Pinto doesn't usually by default anyway. It, it, it ignores Perl. Uh, it ignores core modules. You have to tell it which version of of Perl you're targeting. That's actually one of the configuration options that the Pinto has. Uh, and if, if there's a core dependency, it will, it will just ignore that. Uh, but let me, get, let me get through this demo, uh, and, and we'll, we can talk about that more. I can, I can filter uh, the stacks here, but I just want to get a quick look at like where, which modules are on which stack, or do they have the same versions or not. This is a kind of a quick and dirty way to do to do a diff, right? And it's much prettier to look at than uh, than that long uh, text output. Let's jump into one of these. Um, and here I can open these up and see the packages that are inside each one of them. Uh, over here I got links out to MetaCPAN so I can see the documentation for any of them. And this takes me to the documentation for that release, right? That's always kind of a frustration when I'm on MetaCPAN. I have to find the right page for the release that I'm that I'm working on. Uh, here, uh, got uh, history. This is a prettier version of that log with my lovely face. And I also get these nifty graphs, which will show me how the different distributions on the stack relate. So this is telling me that um, uh, it's telling me that the HTTP daemon depends on libww Perl, and these modules depend on it. Uh, it's, 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 in D3, it's, it's called a, an edge bundling graph. I'm not, yeah, and I can like spin it around and, and do cool Because these graphs can get really, really big. Um, and there, there is kind of a point where they're, they're almost unmanageable. Let me see if I can find them here. I've seen scatters that are really pretty good. Somebody can read them. <laughs> so here, this is the graph for stratapan.com itself. Oops, no, that's just the and I don't, I don't have a good measurement or metric of like what kind of the standard, what a typical stack size is, but I hope that this is a, at the at the large edge. <laughs> you cash those images, right? So it's terribly useful. 
So one one thing that uh, so looking at the whole picture is kind of obviously it starts to deteriorate uh, at some point. <laughs> what what we'll probably do here is, is just add, add some kind of filter. So you could, instead of looking at the relationship between everything in the stack, you could pick a starting point. Um, you know, let's say catalyst. And you could say, oh, just show you me still everything. Look like that. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you could say, you know, just show me everything that's connected to catalyst. I, I, don't, like, I, don't, I don't care about anything else. Um, so, but but this is incredibly helpful because I'll, I'll let me jump back to a more manageable. Uh, let's do let's do appropriate. Do appropriate. Okay. So, why is this helpful? Um, Helps you visualize stuff without doing any work. All right. So. You know, let's say, let's say that we were about to upgrade exception class. And when you do that, it's a smart idea to smoke test the things that depend on it, right? To make sure they're still compatible with each other. And this gives you a quick way of figuring out what that is. When we look at this and we can say, oh, we're going to have to smoke test uh, PPIX utilities and ProCritic 119. Uh, the question I have is, are, is the dependency calculation from Pinto better than the one that's on like MetaCPAN, which only uses what's inside the package's dependencies, as opposed to the you call them unofficial dependencies that many modules have? Because um, they haven't listed them all. No. So Pinto is, uh, relies, on, relies on the metadata. So we can't watch you install it and see what is what actually gets installed. Right. So, yeah, that that is sort of the, the problem with with Perl in general, right? It's just insanely dynamic. Uh, you can't really rely on, on much of anything. Um, <laughs> it's it's all kind of you know best approximation. It, it seems. So it does its best. So it does its best. And most of the time, it, it comes out right. Um, but that's also why you want to you want to be very good at being good in the build up the machine and the What's required for one time? What's required for test? Yes. yes, and it's easy to it's, it's much easier to suss that th that sort of thing out um, if you have a kind of a build process where you where you start from scratch. Right. Or, or at least a, a very well-known starting point, and you can build stuff up. Where you get into trouble is where, when your environment is sort of, it's polluted, right? It's in some unknown state because it has accreted modules over time from different people uh, that were installed in different ways. And who only, you know, the only way to know is to actually run the thing, right? Uh, and by then, it's much too late. The idea with Pinto is you, you have much more control over your dependencies, or you at least have a, have a way to control your dependencies. So you could spin up a new virtual machine with a blank slate, build everything up, and if you haven't declared a dependency, you're going to find out. And this is happening a lot more now. We're doing cloud-based uh, sort of stuff. We turn on machines. We use Vagrant and Puppet and stuff. We build things up from bare metal all the time now. Right. Uh, and so I, I think Pinto is just a nat fits naturally into that sort of DevOps culture where you want to push a button and mint out a new machine, and you want it to come out exactly the way the last one did. So this is in beta right now, uh, stratofan.com. You're all welcome to sign up, get yourself a free beta account. All the beta users get uh, sort of unlimited gold key access <laughs> um, but this and this is not this is not free though All right this 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 is real money yeah uh, so you know if if you're a if you're a shop that's that writes any kind of pearl uh, this this is a valuable service for you
yeah, sure, you can roll your own with Pinto. I'd be happy if you did. Uh, but if, it's, if you don't want to manage it, just like I don't want to manage my GitHub repository, my Git repository, I let GitHub do it for me. I give them a few bucks, they give me a nice looking UI, and I don't have to think twice about it. Same thing with Pinto. You've got, we've got your Pro modules stashed for you. Uh, they're there for you to install anytime you want. And uh, let's look back here. All right? You get this URL. It's uh, my user account, repository name, stack name. You just feed that to CPAN. Right? That's all you have to know. This is great if you're a consultant or, or you need to ship code to third party clients and you need a way to convey the dependencies from your environment to their environment. Yeah. Right? Well, most of the time, maybe they know how to use CPAN or CPANM or something like that. You just tell them, yeah, just point it over here and install my module. Done. So right. if you're running a Pinto as a central server, yeah. is it running as a daemon? Yes. So there, there's, as part of the Pinto distribution that you get from CPAM, there is a Pinto DE server that just, uh, it's, it's, a, it's built on Flack and it does two things. It listens for remote commands from Pinto clients. So all those things that I did at the command line, I was doing with a local repository. Right? It was sitting there right inside my directory. I can also put that directory on another server and address it via HTTP and do all of that to a remote control repository. Uh, any of you guys in academia? Okay, Let's wrap up. Yeah. All right. This is thrilling stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody in academia? All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, uh, you know, reproducibility is especially important in academia. Uh, you know, someone, you write a research paper on, on uh, particle physics or something, or if you find the god particle with Pearl, you, <laughs> other, other people are going to want to verify that. Right? They're going to need to reproduce your code, rerun your tests, uh, reproduce the results. And how are they going to do that? Right? There's, how are they going to construct the, the same uh, set of tools that you use? Uh, unless, unless you, you have to go to great lengths <coughs> to accomplish that. It's much, much easier with something like Stratifab. You can just say, well, you know, install what's in this stack. Right? Or actually what you would probably do is you would put your little god particle distribution in here. Right? And it's going to depend on all of these things. <coughs> and you say, install god particle. By the way, well, almost yes, exactly. Real applications have interdependencies, but the languages we're all still tribal, right? We still manage. We have our own tools for managing. We use Bower for JavaScript, and we use CPanem for Perl, and we use Maven for Java. Yeah, we have to. Uh, By the way, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, uh, in this, there is the WX library, graphic library. Yeah. That uh, for compiling WX widgets, it pulls uh, actually a copy of, uh, a, it downloads a table of WX widgets and compiles it. So, how would it pull the copy of the uh, with uh, this process? Which is, it's it's yeah. relatively unique, but WX is a popular distribution. Um, so whatever WX does when you install it, uh, Pinto doesn't know about. Right? If, if, if WX does something wacky, um, then it, you know by that time you have left Pinto. Okay. Uh, you're installing on the machine. You're outside of Pinto's purview. Uh, if, 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 if WX is designed to go out and just fetch random stuff from the wild and build it. I don't know. I would. That would. Uh, that would make me nervous. Right. That's exactly the kind of problem that Pinto wants to solve. And different question here. Essentially, uh, one can make always a bundle, which is a PM file with exact versions, and uh, you can ship always the bundle. Um, so that when someone install, okay, you install a bundle of this project. 
and it pulls exact versions that are specified on the bundle. Yes, you have to then think about all the dependencies. Mm -hmm. right, you have to make sure they're all listed. Um, you, you don't have uh, uh, there, there is, bundles is one way to do it for sure uh, well, are you using them within Pinto? no no so the idea Pinto there's, there's the, the basic problem here is right the, the, the public CPAN is constantly changing and the tools are all designed for selecting the latest version of things version dependencies are not hardened they're flexible. It's always this number or later. So there's many ways to solve that problem. One is bundle or private CPAN beer. Or use cart, which is another tool that's kind of like bundle. It just basically writes down, this is the version of the dependency. This is the exact version of the distribution that I used to build this. Pinto solves it a different way. It, it creates a CPAN beer that is stable and does what you want it to. And it only changes when you want to change it. Uh, you can do some kind of cool things on top of this, like browse, potentially browse the, the documentation. You were asking for that earlier. Right? Yes. You want to have your own CPAN complete with searchable documentation yes. and that sort of stuff. There's actually a lot of tools that will do that for you, existing tools. All you have to do is point them at a CPAN mirror, in this case your Pinto repository, and boom, you get a website of all the documentation. So. Because Pinto under the hood is just a CPAN repository, uh, all those tools they just work. Can you pin everything in your Pinto repository so that if you install a new module, it'll warn you if it tries to upgrade any dependencies? So you can lock if, if if you what you can do is lock a stack, which basically means there can be no changes of any kind. Well, I want to be able to install a new module, but I don't want it to install any dependencies new. except brand new ones. I don't want it to change anything that's in there. So that cut and grip thing you mentioned earlier? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know. That, that I was thinking module. if you pin everything in there, you can it's still not. add new things. You just can't modify existing things. So it makes it, you know, not updated. I, I see. I see. Um, it seems like you really want a warning now for me that way. Like, tell me before you do it and then let me decide. Because then otherwise you're pinning everything and then unpinning everything except the one thing you really want to pin for a different reason. Yeah. So, what you can't, there's a dry run mode. <laughs> so you can run it and see what would change. Uh, and, then, and then decide whether or not to, to commit to that. Uh, but I, the, 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 the normal mode of operation is when you want to upgrade something, you usually want to accept whatever dependencies it, requ the new dependencies it requires. Um, because you can do that on a separate stack, you can do that safely without disrupting your, your main line. And so if it doesn't work out, you can throw the stack away and, and wait till the next release comes out or shop for a different module or something like that. Yeah, so you just create your stack, install, then do a diff, yeah. and anything that is going to change. So I'm out of time. Uh, I just want to thank you all and thank, thank Lambert for, for bringing me down here. Thank you.